Hello, everybody. This is International Master Jesse Cry, and um, today I'm doing a lecture entitled Practical Night End Game. I had this position with White against Camilla Baganskaita at round eight of the recent U.S. Championship in San Diego in March. And um, this to me is a very interesting uh, position. Uh, in the game, I thought, okay, maybe I, maybe I have a small advantage. My knights on d4 is better placed than her knight on e7. My king on c3 is better placed than the king on d7. And I have a space advantage. Um, but really, what's interesting about this position is that actually black's in a little bit of trouble. And I'm very uh, surprised in looking over the game that black indeed really has some problems here. And I think the main lesson uh, that I've got out of studying this position uh, is that if we took the knights off the board here, the king, pawn, king and pawn endgame would be drawn. If we took the knights off and put bishops on the board, uh, the bishop ending would be drawn. If we put rooks on the board, it would also be a draw. So... What's funny here is that if it's true that black has some trouble here, it speaks, it speaks volumes about what's going on in the knight end game in general. And um, the knight end game is the most complicated of all the end games because really they're so tricky and they can't, as we'll see later, they have really a hard time losing a move to create a zoop swarm position. And that actually makes the whole thing a lot more complicated. A bishop can avoid zoop swarm by just moving one square different every time along a diagonal. But a knight, we'll see, really has difficulties in some positions. And this makes things a lot more difficult for the game. And little things will mean a lot. And in particular here, what we'll find is white's space advantage is very critical. Critical because white can use that space advantage to cut down the number of squares available to the black knight. And also, as we'll see, it's critical because white's pawns simply are closer to the edge of the board in this position. And that, as we'll see in night end games, is of critical importance. So in this position, I, didn't, I unfortunately didn't think too long about my decision, and I played f4, um, which isn't a bad move. But the problem, let's just see, she has a nice counter strategy against f4 that I didn't appreciate during the game. f4, knight c6, my knight goes away, and now b5. And this was the move I had missed. Uh, b5 is a hard move to anticipate because it willingly gives up the square c5. But her point is that by taking away the square c4, my king on c3 really is going to find it hard to infiltrate into the black position. Also, with b5, she's gaining space on the queen side. And we'll see later she has a nice idea of playing a5 to loosen my strong pawns on b4 and a3. Let's go back and take a look at what I maybe should have done. I think in this position, a little sounder would have been to play a4. And the point is, after knight c6, knight b3, now b5 is not possible. So um, let's just maybe take a look at how this might go. Say knight e5, f4, knight g4, h3 knight e3 and g3, and now we'll find that the knight is trapped behind the white pawns. It might even get trapped uh, forever. But the main point will be that this knight is out of play due to being trapped behind the pawns, being caught off sides, and white will be able to make progress in the center and against the pawns on the wing with his own king and knight. So this, does, this variation looks a little dangerous for black. And also, um, if we could play g5, notice that if white just, black just gives me the opportunity to play f4 myself, then I'll really have achieved my goal of cutting down the knight's squares. Um, for example, things could go in this position something like 
B5, Knight E5, Knight C5, King C7, King D4, and now after, say, Knight G4, F3, Knight H2, King E5, even though white's down a pawn, that's only temporary, um, black will find it very hard to defend this position because of the white's king's infiltration. Okay. So a4, I think, was probably the correct move just in terms of stopping this nice plan that she came up with. But interestingly enough, and this, I think, is uh, interesting for understanding the knight endgame, is that even after f4, which seems like an inaccuracy because I allow this plan of b5, even after this position, it turns out that black still has some considerable difficulties. Let's take a look at how things develop from here. Now, one thing I should mention in this position is that uh, most discussions of knight end games will just be a bunch of variations. But what's interesting about all end games is usually they're fought at the end of a very long struggle. So here we've already been playing for almost four hours. Um, in this position, let's see, I had 34 minutes left to make move 40, where we're at move 28 here, and she only had 15. And um, that's just the way end games work, especially nowadays with less time. In fact, compared to a lot of tournaments, the US Championship is luxurious in that we had um, almost two hours for 40 moves, plus an extra 30 seconds for every move we made, we got an increment. And then uh, for the last bit, we got, an we got another hour for move 60 and then 15 minutes after that. And then we'll see in this game, this time uh, control will be a part, simply a part and parcel of the game itself. So, my opponent played a good move, 97. Now, because I've given her the square d5, my plan is kind of simple. I want to now expand in terms of space on the king side. King d4, king c6, g4. Now, here I was very happy um, because it seemed to me I'd cut down her knight squares, and I'm looking forward to playing f5, which will be hard to meet because A, I'm threatening to create a weakness on e6 by playing f5, and the threat of f6 is also very hard to meet. But my opponent came up with another very nice defensive move, which I hadn't properly appreciated. She played king b6. This is a very good move. So the point is, is that uh, she's threatening at some point to play knight c6, drive my king away, and if my knight moves, then she's looking forward to playing a5 and creating a weakness on the queen side. And this is critical because if she can create a weakness on the queen side that I have to worry about, it'll be a lot harder for me to press my advantage in space on the king side. Okay, so I played king e4, avoiding the check of the knight. And again, she played a very nice move. She played g6. So she's in no hurry to play knight c6. If she played knight c6 immediately, then I can hit with f5. Let me take a look at that briefly. Knight c6, f5. And this is a very scary position for black. Um, for example, maybe you could go a5, takes, takes, um, knight d4, knight c4, and some tactic like knight e6. Very hard to meet. For example, f takes, f6, and the game's over. And here, this variation demonstrates what I was saying earlier about um, the difficulty in um, the pawns being so far advanced. Actually, <laughs> that variation might not have been totally sound, but the general idea is what's important. There's more than one way I could have played that. I can play f6 before I play knight takes e6 as well. Okay. So g6 is a good move, and the point is now, when I play knight d4, she plays knight c6. And see, the problem is I can never really go into a king and pawn endgame.
For example, now knight takes, king takes, and she has two squares, c6 and b6, to prevent me from infiltrating on c5. And my king really only has d4. So I can never create a Zugzwang situation where she has to move away from c5 to let me into the position. So essentially, all of these um, king and pawn endgames are drawn. For example, if I play f5, she can just respond g5. Now, at this point, I think, just on a practical level, I was a little disappointed in myself in that I felt like I had missed some critical moves here. I had missed the, this b5 idea, and now I had missed king c6, b6, uh, with a nice, some nice defensive opportunities. Um, but in fact, in, in this position, black's still in trouble. And um, the simplest thing for me to do here would have just been to play h3. And after that, black's essentially in Zugzwang. For example, a6, h4. And surprisingly, this position is uh, well, this position is lost now for, for black. Um, for example, knight c6, f5, takes, takes, a5, takes, knight takes, knight d4. Um, it's not going to be possible to defend this position. If ef, I take with a knight, and I'll hit h6. And um, if knight c4, then we can do this tactic again, knight e6, with a winning position. Anytime notice that I win a pawn on the king side, it's much more important than she winning the pawn on the queen side, because my pawns are so much closer to queening. And that's part of the problem of this whole knight endgame. So um, here, obviously, I made a mistake. Um, I had to play h3 in this position. There's other variations. Maybe it might be instructive to look at those. For example, h3, a6, um, h4, h5, with the idea of undermining my pawn situation and maybe gobbling up h4. But that doesn't work because if pawn takes knight d4, dominating the position, knight g6, and knight f3 with a winning position because now I'm going to play f5 next move and if she plays knight e7 then I can just play knight g5 and I'll be gobbling up the pawns. Okay, so let's sidestep. So here um, I did a very bad thing. I really made a howler of a move at this point. Um, and I think I was moving too fast encouraged by her time pressure. And I played knight d4, which just allows knight c6. And now after knight c2, she goes ahead with her plan and plays a5. And she's going to create a weakness now um, in my camp. So I played f5. And she again plays this nice move, g5, cutting my king's opportunity to penetrate into her position. And when you look at it, really g5 is the mirror image of b5 on the other side of the board and with the same idea of cutting my own king's um, opportunities for advancing. f6, pawn takes, pawn takes. She played king c7, and I played h3. And here, uh, the game really should be drawn at this point, but she made a move which doesn't throw away the game, but really, uh, I think, made the whole practical task of the situation a lot harder. Um, the simple way to have done things here would be just to go back. So now if I want to draw, which I might have to take here, I can just play knight d4. Now she can't play knight takes b4 because of knight takes e6, but she can just play knight takes d4, king takes d4. And after king c6, there's just no way for anyone to penetrate into the position. But I'm guessing here that she saw a ghost. I think she was worried here that on king b6, I would play knight e3. And uh, how dangerous this is, well, it's not dangerous at all, but I think from a practical position, it might be a little scary. For example, knight takes knight f5, and who knows what's going on. But really, um, even though there's maybe more than one way to defend this, 
The simplest would be just to play king c7. And now I cannot play knight f5 due to simply pawn takes, pawn takes, and a very nice move, counter shot, knight takes e5. The point being, after king takes king c6, it's actually now white who's going to lose. The white king will be pushed back, and black has the outside pass pawn. So white will have to go fetch that pawn, and black in the meantime will eat the f5 and f6 pawns. So, but also it's kind of an interesting situation because what happens in all end games when you're going into the fifth or sixth hour of play is that you start seeing things. And especially with night end games, with these pawns so far advanced, it's very frightening. So, in this position, she played king d7. And her thought was that after knight a3, takes, takes, and I'm threatening now knight d6, but she can defend with king e8. I think her thought was that this position should be easily drawn. And this is the whole problem of knight end games, is they're so tricky. There's so many tricky things that can happen. Uh, so I'm convinced, actually, that black should still be able to draw this. But I'm just going to show what happened uh, as a demonstration of why this is actually so difficult. I played knight d4, which was my last move of time control. I just had a couple seconds left, and she played king f8. And here I really didn't have any great kind of plan here, so I'm not going to talk too much about what I did. I just played knight f3. But I'm hanging kind of threats over her head, even though I don't think they're very real. I'm protecting the pawn, which gives my king freedom, and I might play h4 at some point which is something maybe she has to be concerned about. But that's precisely the problem. She doesn't know where I'm going to attack. And white has a lot of freedom because really white can't lose in this position. So she commits her king to the king's side. I played knight e1, king h7, knight d3. She cannot go into the king and pawn in game, uh, just as an example. White will always win the king and pawn at game. Right? And black will slowly get uh, moved back, and I'll win the f7 pawn in the game. So, she played knight d5. I think here she's still drawing, but uh, maybe knight c6 was more tenacious. Knight c5. Okay, and here I think she began to see the ghost. Um, and this is typical, I think, of knight endgame positions, especially one where white has such a far advanced pawn here. Um, so one ghost is that if I get to d7, she can no longer play king g6 because of knight f8 mate. But that's just really a cute thing. There's no way she has to, no reason for her to fall into that. Also, if I get to d7, I'll be defending the pawn on e5, and then my king will have chances to move around. Um, but really, I think all of this is, is truly just illusory. If she just goes back and forth, say, king g6, knight d7, king h7, and even now, just moving back and forth, um, maybe she can even take this pawn here. But even this position, I've looked at for several, well, for hours, and I can't find any way for white to make any progress. The point is, whenever my king runs around, one of my pawns will be weak. In this position, it's the g4 pawn, and prior to that, the h3 pawn is in difficulty. So, but that's in, in hindsight, so that's hard to see over the board, that black doesn't have any difficulties. During the game, I thought she might. So here... Um, she made an instructive mistake, but really the spirit of her move was correct. She wants to break free before she has to commit to some kind of passive defense, like in the variation where we just saw where she's just moving back and forth. So she played h5. I took. And now she played king h6. And here in this position, now she's in trouble. I played king f3, threatening king g4. She took, 
and then I played knight takes e6, which is a critical theme all along. So in this position, I was very happy. But then she did something very uh, interesting. She played knight takes f6. And when I took back, she played king g6. And in this position, I thought for a long time. At first, it looks like I'm going to win easily. But in fact, this position is not easy at all. And in order to understand this, I'm going to stop here and show a different position, which crossed into my memory banks when I was thinking what to do on this move. So the position that crossed my mind was this position, at least the idea behind this position, uh, which I had studied maybe a year prior to this game. And it's very rare for me to remember such obscure things. So I was especially proud that I remembered this during the game. And this is the kind of situation that I think Camilla was hoping for. The point is that the knight is a miserable piece when it comes to losing a move. Okay? So in this position, black played f6 and essentially put white into Zugzwang. So what I mean by that is the white, the knight, if it's just the knight to move, if the knight's the only one that gets to play, right, like in this position, because if the king moves, the white king moves, then black can come to g4 and trade off his pawn on h5. So the knight's a funny piece. He goes, if he just moves around, he can't lose a move. He always goes from a light square to a dark square, a light square and a dark square. He can never get out of that pattern. So in this position, if it were actually black to move, white would win. But now that it's white to move, white's unable to win. Let's just look how this game went. Knight f4, king g5. Now we're black might at some point be threatening h4. So check. Knight c5, king g5, knight e4, king f5. And again, if it were black's move, uh, white would win, and but now it's not <laughs> it's not black's move. It's white's move. Knight f2, king g5, and there's really just no way to make progress after knight h5, king f5, and knight f4, king g5. The players agree to a draw. So a very strange position, where it would seem like white has an overwhelming material superiority but it's unable to win. Let's go back to the game with Camilla. So let's return to this position. What I realized is that what Camilla was aiming for was something similar to the Smyslov game. And if I make a normal move, like knight d4, we get a situation where, say, after king takes, king g4, king g6, I'm really unable to make progress. If the knight moves away from f5, black will play f5 and easily exchange a pawn. So, and then if knight f5, we play king f6. And white's in trouble. Here's no way for him to make progress. The king has to stay where it is, like in the Smyslov game. And uh, the knight really can't make progress. For example, knight g3, king g6. Notice uh, as well that if it were black to move here, uh, white would win easily. For example, king f6, uh, white could play knight e4, and on king h6, we could play king f5, slowly bringing the king in and forcing uh, the black king away from his pawns. So I realized we had a very strange situation, and uh, the possibility arose suddenly that Maybe it was a draw. But I thought for a long time here, and I came up with a solution that it wasn't so much I was so proud of the solution, but I was proud of the fact that I recognized this is a potentially big problem for white. I played knight f8. And the main point of this is after king takes, when I play king g4, she can't play king to g6, which is where she wants to go. So she has to play king g7, and then I play knight d7, taking away the square that she wants to go to. King h6, knight e5. 
And now she's forced to play f6, which is very nice because now that square can't be used by her king in shuffling back and forth. Knight f3, king g6, now it's easy. Knight d4, king g7, king h5, black resigns. So if king f7, king h6, king e7, king g6, the black king will be forced away from the pawns. And if king h7, knight f5, taking away g7, and again the black king will be uh, separated from the black pawns. So this was a very interesting game. Uh, to me, it was it offered really good practical experience in understanding the nature of the knight end game, and especially what it made me aware of is just how volatile these knight end games are. How fundamentally difficult to judge they are, how much calculation they demand, and also respect because in most positions, like the beginning position that we faced, those kinds of positions most people think of as just drawish with other pieces on the board. But with knights on the board, it becomes a much more difficult situation. So, I hope you enjoyed the game. Bye-bye.